Hello, guys. So today our guest is uh, Munir Banshamlet, who is the founder of Paraswap. It's a decentralized exchange aggregator. Nice to meet you here, Munir. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. So can you tell us about your journey in crypto? How did you get into it? What's your background? Yeah, so uh, being involved in crypto, it's been a few years. I was a big user in the beginning. Uh, that big that I left my job just to build something in crypto. That was in early 2018. And back then I didn't have a clear idea. I had a few ones, uh, but none of them uh, really uh, took my heart. So I started iterating and doing some freelance work till uh, late 2018 when I decided to work on decentralized exchanges and started with a uh, few iterations which led me to a power swap that we know uh, today and that was in late summer 2019. And how did the idea of starting Paraswap uh, come to you? Because at that time, uh, decentralized exchanges were not that much popular. So why did you decide to make focus exactly on decentralization? Yeah, so I was a user of uh, DEXs at the time. There were very few. Uh, the most known one was Ether Delta that uh, doesn't, does no longer exist uh, nowadays. So it was the most, I would say, liquid in those, those days, uh, standards. Uh, Dex and uh, back then there were a lot of ICOs, so people were using ETL Delta to get instant liquidity from from there. But it was way too slow, too expensive. There were a lot of front running issues. So the initial idea was to build a better Ether Delta, something that people can use normally and be less frustrated, something that's going to be more scalable in performance and so on. And by starting working on that, well, this was the time when Uniswap just launched. Uh, Kyber Network went live on mainnet. Uh, Bankware was already there and started getting some traction. Um, so I said, okay, maybe let's build an aggregator uh, because there is existing liquidity. So let's grab this liquidity from there and make it in a unified interface so that even though we have a small liquidity per exchange, if you group them all, we're going to have a liquid exchange. So that was the, I would say, the next iteration that I started working on. And then I said, okay, how about having this uh, DEX or DEX aggregator accessible to the public? So that anyone can access, can use DEXs uh, instead of using centralized exchanges. So the idea was to build like a Coinbase or a decentralized Coinbase for retail. Um, that was launched in early summer 2019, which was a very naive idea. And exactly from what you said, uh, people were not ready for taxes. Taxes were really small. Uh, there were a lot of barriers to entries. Uh, we still have them, but the market is doing much better right now that people can get over those barriers to entries. So we had to ask users still to have a MetaMask, to uh, understand how private key works, to sign transactions, to pay for gas, and so on, which really didn't took up. So it took uh, a month or two to iterate and say, okay, this is not maybe, or this is too early for the markets. Let's maybe build something for the DeFi niche at the time. It was a very small community of around three, 4,000 people on a Telegram group called DeFi. It still exists, but no longer really as successful as it was back at the time. Um, so yeah, I mean, one thing led me to the other. In the beginning, I was a user and I wanted something better for me personally and maybe build it for the crowd which led me to build something for the bigger crowd, for the public, mm -hmm. which was really early on the market. So that I said, okay, let's focus on the niche and let's also build something that can be used by other dApps, like other protocols or dApps, uh, which was also not a bad idea because many wallets were using one exchange and not getting the best out of the liquidity. So they were like only on Kyber, only on Uniswap, but maybe they were better off of aggregating all those exchanges. So the need for an aggregator was quite obvious. And nowadays it's becoming normal, like all wallets and, and dApps who need access to liquidity, they would integrate directly in aggregator. And when did you see the huge growth of uh, the users of Paraswap? Yeah, we've seen a good growth. The main metric uh, we've been tracking is the volume, uh, which grew by a lot, um, especially on uh, since May 2021 of last year. And it's continuously growing, uh, more mostly stabilizing right now, around $100 million a day, uh, sometimes more. So that was the main, uh, main, main I would say, uh, metric because our main targets 
uh, is kind of a B2B, DeFi, or if you can call it this way, because you have either wallets and uh, power, to power users, like big DeFi traders or farmers who will use an aggregator for very specific reasons. And these guys, they make a lot of volume. Or dApps like Argent, Ledger, uh, Metamask, Aave, who aggregates users and use us as a backend. So their users, they don't even know that they are using Parasol behind the scenes. And uh, we perform this hard work for them. We perform those integrations and those algorithmic uh, improvements and so on. So that was the main metric. That's why we said, okay, let's track only volume. Uh, our user base is around 5,000 users a day in a more or less stable, stable way. Now, uh, after launching sidechains, like Polygon, Avalanche, and BSC, and so on, we started seeing another category of users, like retail. They came to us whether we like it or not. So now we started also tracking uh, metrics on retail, on users who are just doing normal trades. Uh, those are users who are coming from Binance, Coinbase, Kraken, and all those places who think that, in, uh, obviously we agree with them, that they are better off using taxes and having non-custodial wallets than using centralized exchanges. So uh, these guys uh, have different needs than, than those big farmers. So that's why we are improving our UI in order to accommodate this guy. So we expect the user, user base to grow in the, in the coming months. But so far, like looking, looking behind, the volume was the main metric. And what do you think about uh, adoption of DeFi by institutionals and uh, other institutional companies uh, using uh, Paraswap? Yeah, I think, uh, well, it's already started and we can see some major projects launched uh, with institutions like uh, Aave Arc uh, with Fireblocks, uh, where institutions are going to use the same Aave protocol, except that they will be using whitelisted pools uh, or whitelisted uh, lending, I would say lending pools, and that's using the same protocol. So, uh, and the good news is that we are integrated into Aave, uh, so we'll be also integrated on, on Arc. It's just the same tech uh, that can accommodate that once, once it reaches a critical mass in terms of users. We are also working on an institutional uh, offer. So it's also the same technology behind Paraswap, the same smart contract and so on, except that it will be a module that's running on top of Paraswap where uh, you are an institution and you cannot trade directly on DeFi for compliance reasons. Well, but you would like to buy CRV, you would like to buy Yearn and, and so on. Um, so you can use Paraswap within this whitelisted module or router. And on the other side, on the other party, it will be market makers, which we call it Paraswap pool. It's already exists. It's been uh, almost two years now. And these guys are also KYC, the AML. So we know these guys uh, personally. Um, and they will be using the same technology. So instead of you as an institution trading on Uniswap, you will be trading on Parasol pool and those market makers are sourcing liquidity from decentralized exchanges and centralized exchanges. So you will be exposed to DeFi tokens and DeFi liquidity without really touching directly DeFi. So which is a straightforward solution to, to these guys. But still there are some institutions who are like DeFi native who are able nowadays to, to trade directly on DeFi. And some of them have some concerns like, well, I would like to trade on Uniswap we are doing this, but we don't feel super confident. If uh, we have a way to score some pools, uh, like uh, Uniswap pool that was mostly, I would say, um, supplied by uh, big other uh, institutions, say in Alameda, Three Rows, or others, who are known parties and their addresses are public and we know how to link their address to their entities. In this case, maybe those pools are not really risky and those institutions can trade on them. So Parasol can also integrate or aggregate certain pools that have a certain trust degree or a certain confidence degree um, plus Parasol pool, which will give these guys a partial access to DeFi, but sufficient enough to be superior than what they can find in centralized venues. Yeah, that's a great solution. And uh, what chains currently does Paraswap sub, uh, support? Um, EVM chains, we have like four right now working on uh, others. The goal is to be on most major 
EVM chains, like all of those who are compatible with the Ethereum. So we are in Ethereum, Avalanche, uh, Polygon, and BSC. Uh, add in also Phantom, but, uh, Arbitrum, Optimism, and others, but also layer twos uh, like um, ZK Sync, uh, Starknets, and definitely Solana, Polkadot, uh, Cosmos chains, and, and others. The idea for us, we are quite uh, agnostic in terms of chains. Mm -hmm. We just look at the liquidity. So if there is enough liquidity and if there is enough demand for, for a ch certain chain, we can uh, integrate it right away. It's, it's quite, it takes only a few days maximum on the backend side. And so uh, there are as well uh, some other popular decentralized exchanges aggregators like One Inch or uh, Matcha. So what are the key differences uh, between Periscope and uh, these players and what, uh, what are the advantages of Periscope? Yeah, so there are quite a few. Uh, in the main product, uh, the main differences that users will be looking when they are trading on Parasol.io, one inch or matcha is the price. Uh, so that's on a pure UI uh, or, or say API perspective. Uh, we think we are very competitive compared to these guys, uh, especially thanks to Parasol Pool, which is, I would say, the first main or major differentiator where we were the first to launch a network of market makers, professional market makers, we call it Parasol Pool, that was back in early 2020. And um, these guys, they offer the same, you can see each one of them as a DEX or as a Uniswap pool, uh, but there is no slippage, no front running, so the prices are fixed. Unlike uh, when you're trading on Uniswap, where you see a price and after the transaction is done, uh, well, the price has moved and maybe you get hit by slippage, maybe your transaction will be reverted. But if you're trading directly with Parasol Pool, well, those prices are fixed for two minutes there is no way they can be front run or, or change. So that's, we were the first to, to launch that. And we also built our tokenomics uh, on top of this. It was our first use case once we launched the PSP, our, our token and our DAO, um, where we try to add more efficiency on, uh, on Parasol Pool in order to make it even more competitive, which we can see clearly the results right now. They are taking a large market share compared to our volume. So one third to 50, sometimes even 70% of our volumes go through Parasol Pool. Also, the third thing is the future plans or the future perspectives. At least uh, I'm going to refer to what has been announced publicly. So we, were, we are also the only ones that announced that we are working on full decentralization of the protocol. Uh, we're not seeking to have any kind of IP uh, or I would say property, uh, us as a core team. We think that aggregators should play a role of a middleware uh, a public good middleware that any DAP or any user can connect to and access decentralized liquidity. And that's also an abstract way because it can be meme tokens, DeFi tokens or whatever, but it can be also uh, tokenized uh, real world assets that will be traded on chain. Um, and an aggregator is an efficient way. And we won't even, even call it an aggregator. We call it the best execution platform as it's called in Forex markets or in stock markets. Uh, there is a need for that. And I think since we are in DeFi and crypto, uh, if that middleware is not decentralized, I think it's going to be redundant with existing tools and it's going to be less efficient than existing tools. So I think there is a lot of value of having a full decentralization of the full uh, infrastructure. Yeah, that's quite great. And can you tell more how does your DAO work and about your PSP uh, token? There was a lot of controversy because you're the first company which made some kind of a airdrop to people who were only active users on Periswap. Yeah, so the main goal is, uh, is connected to what I was saying, is uh, reach a full decentralization. That's going to take few years. Uh, it, those are very hard, I would say, computer science and math and game theory, uh, uh, game theory problematics that have to be to be solved and have to be thought of. Um, so that's our mission is to deliver a fully decentralized middleware. Uh, and that's going to be owned by a DAO. That's, and that DAO, uh, the, its main, I would say, incentive model is the PSV as a token. For governance, uh, that's what we're seeing right now, where the DAO will vote and propose improvements uh, on different areas. It can be uh, basic things like liquidity mining or incentive programs, or it can be also new uh, major components like uh, this uh, gas, uh, gas, I would say, refund model that we're working on, where we're creating like a whole new market for guests. So 
those are some, some of the use cases that the, the, the DAO is, is taking on. Uh, so PSP is used for that, is used to uh, be the main, uh, I would say, uh, token to uh, facilitate that for voting, but also for improvements and for incentives for different, uh, different so I would say, matters. In the future, it also will be used as an incentive for running nodes um, that will be representing uh, the current nodes that we're running as, as a core team. And I mean, I'm saying like, know that delivered pricing, smart contracts are already on chain, are already decentralized. Um, the other question uh, about airdrop. Yeah, it was it was a hard, uh, I would say, uh, process that we went through because um, there were many modules. There were models where if you use our, our, our protocol, hey, you got a token for free. That's that's great. That's like what you can stop to have done or not uh, done in 2020. Um, the thing is the market has changed a lot and since, there were many airdrops that happened. We saw a phenomenon called airdrop hunting or airdrop farming, where many people will use a protocol just to get the airdrop, which is uh, by itself is not a bad thing per se, except that in our context, we had 1.3 million wallets that used Baraswap. And unfortunately, our activity and our volume was completely disconnected from that. So it was a clear farming uh, or like abuse, I would say, of, uh, of our protocol. Um, in exchange and like in expectation to get in a, a token in the future. So we had to um, go through a process where we will, um, with some hypothesis, uh, where we said, okay, we want to give the token to uh, users who are actively using Paraswap. And even that was not easy because many people, they came in in a very short amount of time and you see our user growth, it went exponential. Um, so it was quite hard. So we had to do a lot of trade-offs in order to um, make sure that there will never be a large concentration in the hands of very small group, uh, because we may have the impression that we are ha we're having a decentralized protocol uh, with a lot of holders, like hundreds of thousands of holders. Mm -hmm. But in reality, those are three or four people, which we also uh, released some, some uh, articles showing that one user uh, is connected to hundreds of thousands of users. Like in, in this 1.3 million, you have a 1.3 plus a delta, which is like 20, 30,000 users. Well, those are really the users. All the rest are not users. That's something just, just the fact, because you can see our volume. And that was like 10% of the total DeFi wallets uh, which is also which was too, too much. So uh, we had to make that choice. It wasn't really easy, let me say, after launching, because many people were disappointed. I think we went too harsh in some of the filters because uh, we noticed some patterns that those farmers, what they will do, they will take a wallet, send uh, ETH or Matic to uh, 1,000, 10,000 wallets, mm -hmm. and then each one is going to do a ETH to ETH or Matic to W Matic mm -hmm. a few times, or maybe do stablecoin swaps, and then transfer the whole balance to either the first wallet or maybe to a new wallet. It's going to repeat the process. And that's what you can see in our, one of our articles. We show like a, uh, it's like a graph of, of this, uh, this pattern. So the common denominator between all of them was that they had very small uh, balance in terms of Matic or no balance at all. So mm -hmm. what we said, okay, let's uh, have a threshold on the time of the snapshots. Those who have less than X amounts of uh, Matic, ETH, uh, AVAX, and, and, and so on, these guys will are likely to be farmers. We know that there is a trade-off and accept that the trade-off where maybe was too much was we were expecting like people in Matic to have something around the, I don't remember the exact number, but like $20, uh, which is too much in Matic, you don't, in Polygon, you don't need that much amount of Matic. You can get away with one or two dollars and make hundreds of tra transactions. So that was, I think, one of the mistakes or like the major mistakes that excluded a lot of legitimate users who, who were very angry. And that's what you can see in Twitter nowadays. And so do you plan any uh, do you have any plans for listing on some more exchanges of your PSP token? In DEXs so something we have done. So uh, now we in the beginning we have we weren't involved at all. So we saw a lot of organic liquidity in Uniswap, uh, especially. And then what we noticed is that it was uh, it wasn't like the best liquidity we wish uh, we can see in on the market. It was a Uniswap pool with one percent fee. Uh, which was great for, for, I would say, the liquidity providers. 
but not great for traders like those who want to buy or sell they win they were overpaying for for their swaps so we said okay let's incentivize liquidity on other pools who we think uh, should be more optimized, like a 0 0.3, 0 0.25% fee. And we've done a program with SushiSwap uh, for three months, uh, renewable in the future, with around 5 million uh, PSP. And we've done the same with other taxes, like with uh, QuickSwap, with the Comet and the idea and with the Bancor, uh, the idea is to also maximize the liquidity. And since we are an aggregator, that's not a problem for us to have multiple exchanges, because if you come to Parasat.io to buy or sell PSP, well, you will be routed to the best exchanges, or you may be having uh, splits between different of those exchanges, which is great. I mean, for us, uh, because some people would say it's a fragmentation of liquidity, but for aggregators, this is not, this is never, never a problem. It's, it's the opposite. We can, if we uh, we can add efficiency on top of that. The trades can be even more optimized when the liquidity is fragmented. But yeah, that's that's what we're focused on as a DAO is to uh, make sure uh, PSP is liquid enough. And by doing that, I mean, to do that, we add incentives on top, but we also came up with some uh, also fancy plans like uh, with Balancer, you don't get direct liquidity mining. You, you do it if you deposit PSP on the safety module, which mm -hmm. is another use case of PSP that makes PSP stakers also insurers of last resort. It's similar to this SAFU fund that you can see in Binance, where if uh, users would lose money uh, because of a hack or a bug, uh, this insurance can be used to refund those users and the stakers that they are earning uh, rewards by staking, they will also be slashed in order to refund those victims uh, by the token. So that's another way also of bootstrapping liquidity. And last month you tweeted uh, imagine trading NFTs on Paraswap. Do you have any plans uh, to do anything with NFTs? Yeah, well, um, the V5 of our smart contract is quite modular. Uh, so right now we have uh, this main smart contract that we call Augustus. It starts with the uh, 0x DeFi, uh, with DeFi, in, uh, it's like with uh, expressed in with one. So yeah. 0x DeFi on, on Ethereum, you will see it. And um, it has routers. So routers, we use them right now for uh, gas optimization. You use one router or the other, it's more gas friendly, uh, but uh, any router can be implemented, so it can be swapping multiple tokens for one token, it can be swapping multiple for multiple one to multiple and so on, uh, but it can be also swapping an NFT. So that's a potential use case and that we're thinking about. We don't have a final product, uh, so no, no alpha no alpha yet, but yeah, it's, it's possible. Yeah, that's quite interesting. And uh, can you share with us some upcoming plans for Paraswap? Do you have any partnerships in pipelines? Yes, definitely. So we're working on the institutional side. As, as I said, uh, we're running a few pilots already with some uh, large institutions uh, that are very happy with the service and very happy to have finally access to DeFi at best prices and much, much lower fees compared to centralized venues. Um, other plans like NFTs and uh, automations and DeFi that also it's also planned either through, uh, with us directly or with partners, uh, things like cross-chain swaps. Uh, that's already uh, almost in production uh, through LiFi, which is a bridge aggregator, uh, like a cross-chain bridge aggregator that's built a library that can let you swap ETH on Ethereum uh, to DAI on Polygon or anything uh, else like that. It's working very well with the Connect as well, uh, Connect the bridge, uh, the bridge, the cross-chain bridge. Um, adding also more chains. So the more chains uh, we add, the better, because we see more and more demands. But also, if you can go to our forum, uh, the governance forum, that you can see it uh, on, on the websites, uh, you will see a lot of uh, things happening uh, from the community this time. It used to be us that will push in proposals in the beginning, but now we see a, a lot of community in incentives in order to make um, the DAO grow and have uh, either more use cases for the tokenomics or just the better products. And one that is active right now is regarding the gas we're creating like a new markets for gas between traders and stickers. Yeah, that's cool when you have such active community participants who try to make your DAX aggregator much better. Yes, indeed. So thank you for such a nice conversation. Yeah, thanks for having me. I was uh, very pleased to be here.